Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining the Darien Library this evening. We are so lucky to have Maria Provenzano, author of Everyday Celebrations from Scratch, doing two demos with us tonight. Ooh, yeah. uh, her, her new book, I hope, I'm, do I have it there? There you go, is available at Barrett Bookstore in Darien and all over the place. She's been doing signings and, and book talks and demos and running around like crazy. And we want to thank the uh, friends of the library who make these programs possible. So let me tell you a little bit about Maria. Maria Provenzano is a lifestyle expert who, who loves having inspiring ideas and crafting with unique recipes. She believes in all things homemade and hopes to encourage others to add a bit of creativity and fun to their every day. Her website, From Scratch with Maria Provenzano, is a resource for numerous magazines, including Bake from Scratch, Taste of Home, Lux Life Magazine, and Focus. She has also been featured on such sites as the Local Moms Network, Lauren Conrad, Refinery29, and Cafe Mom. She's also been on Giada De Laurentiis, Giada, a digital weekly. She has been a featured guest on the whole, on Hallmark Channel's show, Home and Family, sharing her love of homemade crafts, food, and do-it-yourself projects. Maria hails from the Great Lakes state of Michigan, and we are so happy to have her here. Hi, everybody. Oh, this is exciting. All right. So I am going to start out with a toast. We are toasting the holiday season the kickoff to my book. Um, thank you to everyone for being here. And so I am going to show you how to make an espresso martini. These are trending and they are trending for a reason because they are delicious, but really, really easy to make. And after we make our delicious martini, I am going to move over here and show you how to make chocolate peanut butter bonbons. So that is in my book. Um, everyday celebrations. You can see right here. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more when we make that, but this is a family recipe. So this is something my mom has been making forever. And it's something that we put in our cookie boxes every year. So if you celebrate any holiday this, com this season coming up, this is something to have that you can make for teachers, friends, family. And what I love about it too, is that you can make these ahead of time. And truthfully, you could even start this now and put them in the freezer and they'll be ready to go for the holidays. So everything we're doing is quick, easy, and delicious. So this martini recipe is not in the book. I created this for all of you watching. So thanks for giving me an excuse to create a fun martini recipe. So this um, espresso martini is made with you guess it, espresso. So it actually has, and I uh, wanted to make sure I got exact me measurements for you guys. So this is two ounces of espresso and two ounces of vodka. I do think vodka is uh, the best liquor for this just because you don't want it, anything else to overpower. And I think it's the best thing mixed with uh, the coffee too. Okay, so now to this, I'm going to add Kahlua. Kahlua is a coffee liqueur, if you are not familiar, and it really adds so much flavor. So I'm going to add a half of an ounce of this. And to be honest, you can just play with this recipe how you like it. So try it like this. And you know what? If it tastes too sweet for you, if it tastes, you know, too much coffee for you or whatever it is, you can just accommodate to your liking. So I'm going to put this in a mason jar. And I'll tell you why I'm putting this in a mason jar too. But I have my mason jar here and a little bit of simple syrup. Let's see, right over here. I do a half of a teaspoon of simple syrup. And I do make my own um, simple syrup. Simple syrup, if you aren't familiar, I know we probably have a lot of cookbook uh, lovers watching, but um, simple syrup is equal parts sugar and water. And you just put that uh, on the stove and melt it down until the sugar dissolves and then you let it cool. So, and now it's time for ice. So that's what's in here. And I'm gonna add in my ice. And so the reason I put this in a mason jar. When I was testing this recipe and doing all the research for why this recipe is, or this uh, martini is so popular, it's because it has this foam. So you can see the foam on top. However, funny enough, this foam is not created by anything other than air. I know some people do egg whites, some people do 
um, like a Bailey's. However, all you need to do is just shake it enough to get a lot of air in it. So I found when I put this in a martini shaker, number one, I couldn't see if it was foamy enough <laughs> just because at least the martini shakers that I have are not see-through. So that's number one. Um, but that was, I, I just think like, the fact of the mason jar, something magical happens in this, and I'm telling you, it creates the best foam. And so I'm going to shake, so if it's a little loud, bear with me. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them now, initially. And if not, I will just go into my martini making. But I'm going to give this a shake. And if you did want to make this um, ahead of time, and you wanted to do like a big batch of it, I would just mix everything up. So let's say you wanted four cocktails. I would mix it all up ahead of time without the ice. And then I would um, then bring it out and make sure to stir it really, really well. And then pour it individually in the mason jar and then shake it up front. So as you can see here, I'm giving it a good, a good shake. So sorry if this is loud. So you can see, right? You have your foam, which I just love. All right, now, this is what you do. Take this off and then because we have ice in it and I don't, don't have the martini strainer, this is what I do. Look at that. It's sort of like rustic meets fancy, right? Cause we got our rustic mason jar, but our like fancy martini glass. And then this is optional, but you can add in a few, little coffee beans. And that is your espresso martini. And you do wanna make these up fresh. That's when you'll have your foam. Look at that, isn't that so pretty? I'm gonna taste it because, you know, for um, just uh, quality standards and purposes. Oh, it's so good. And you know what? I just do a little bit of that simple syrup. So if you wanted, to make it sweeter, you absolutely could, or you could just not sweeten it at all. It's actually very good without the, the sweetener. Don't mind me, I'll do one more sip and then move on. All right, let's see. If there's any questions, again, feel free. I'm gonna move this to the side here. Someone asked, oh. how did you decide to write this book? Oh, thank you for asking. <sighs> Truthfully, it's been a dream my whole life to write a cookbook. Um, when, when most people I think my age are, were watching like MTV and um, Nickelodeon, I was watching Martha Stewart and um, cooking and baking with my mom in the kitchen. Um, so this is something that I've been doing my whole life. I, I, all I know is to cook and bake from scratch. And um, you know, my, my mom was a Martha Stewart. She always had me in the kitchen with her. And that's really where we, we bonded. And, um, and so for me, I have always created recipes and connected through food. So for me, being in the kitchen with my mom was connection, right? So I always, I always put creativity and connection together. And my, my dad's family, um, they, when they came here from Italy, they came from Sicily and, uh, and, the way, the only thing that they knew was food. And that's how they connected with the community. So they opened a, a, a grocery store called Provenzano's Market. And it was in the town of Saginaw, Michigan, where I'm from. And so for me as a kid watching this, I always, like I said, saw, saw creativity and food as a way to connect with community. And so for me, it just is like this big open arm, like come in for a hug type of thing whenever I see it. So for, so when I, would spend time with my mom cooking and baking in the kitchen. It was just something I always did. So, I mean, I was in college, like decorating my apartment and like making themed food for Halloween before Pinterest existed. And um, so then, you know, fast forward a little bit, uh, 2012 happened with the whole like blogging world and uh, Pinterest came on board, Instagram, all those places. And I started to put my, my love out there. So finally, when people asked me for my chocolate peanut butter bon bon recipe, I was able to put it out there. So to answer, that's a very long way of answering your simple question, but 
my my whole life. I mean, I was reading cookbooks as a kid. I know all the old school Martha Stewart ones, Julia Child, everything. And so for me, cookbooks are are truly a passion of mine. I love to sit and read a cookbook. So for me, read, writing this book, I wanted to write something that I would read. And I wanted something that had like a lot of depth and gravity and and not just like a recipe and a photo. I wanted to have tips and I wanted to have stories and I wanted to have inspiration and I wanted people to feel uplifted after reading this. So that's, that's my long answer. <laughs> Someone also okay. asked, what are the tips for those who aren't creative or cra crafty? Well, you are, you just haven't, you haven't seen your full potential yet. Let's put it that way. So what I would honestly recommend when people ask me how to start crafting, maybe if they do feel like it, it's intimidating, they, they didn't grow up doing it, anything like that, anything that feels new, you just have to start in baby steps. So this is what I recommend. One project, pick one. So go to the book, pick out something. Let's say it's pom-poms. I have three ways to make pom-poms in the book because I can't leave well enough alone. My publisher was like, do you need three ways to make pom-poms? I was like, hey, yes, you do. And so um, anyways, so really the idea is that you pick one thing. Pom-poms are extremely inexpensive. You get some yarn. It's like 50 cents and a fork and you can make some pom-poms and then and some scissors and choose one thing from that project and use it for another project. So let's say it's the yarn. Maybe make some yarn Christmas trees, get some cones and some glue. So each time you do a project, you get one new thing. Instead of like, I wanna do five projects, I got a glue gun, I got this, I got this, I got this, you know, then you feel overwhelmed. And I think it's like that with cooking and baking and all those things as well. Start with one and focus on it. And, and I think just like read through the whole thing. I always say that when people like read recipes, read the whole thing. And that's how it is with the DIYs too. And you'd be surprised once it's like anything else. Like my friend just ran a marathon. I mean, she didn't ran, run a marathon the first time she exercised. You know, it's, it's honestly, it's a muscle. It's, it's just like that. You start small, you gradually build. And then let's say it's Christmas and a year from now, you have all these ideas on, how to make it really elevated with a thing of yarn that you learned how to make a year ago. And you've, you know, so that's where I, I say, just start and start with one. That's it. <laughs> one person wanted to know, does your busy schedule allow you to actually cook for your family? Oh well, my gosh, all the time. It's my favorite thing to do. I mean, I, I love a house full of people. It's my favorite. Like aside from doing stuff like this, like actually teaching people how to cook and bake and inspiring people, like my mission in life is to inspire people to be creative because I find so much value in it. Um, but I love a loud house. Like I came from an Italian family. Like I'm used to a big family that's loud. And for instance, I live on a street with a lot of kids, a lot of families. So, you know, for two weekends, the past two weekends in a row, because it's football season, I've been frying pickles from this and making recipes. I did a bolognese, a double batch, because we had so many people over. And that to me, that makes me happy. And to feed people, to inspire people and like get a text from my friend's friend the next day that's like, oh my God, I need the bolognese recipe. So that to me, I mean, all self-serving, right? Because I feel so good about, about entertaining people and making people happy. And at the end of the day, it's all about community and bringing people together. So, yes. <laughs> Sounds good. Should we go oh, on? Excuse me. Yes. Okay. These chocolate peanut butter bonbons are, like I said, in the book. And right here. So if you don't have the book, I, I encourage getting it because this recipe will save you this holiday season. I make this all year round. This is my go-to if I need to bring something to a party, mostly because I think a lot of recipes like like a biscotti or a cookie or whatever it is, those things are, they can be time sensitive. Or for instance, I made three different types of cookies for a Christmas party last year and it was outside. I live in Southern California by the beach. So that salty air, like the cookies being outside for an hour or two, they, they were no longer crispy the way I wanted them or have that like nice chewy crunch because of all the, the moisture. So these chocolate peanut butter bonbons 
are foolproof, weatherproof, everything proof. <laughs> yeah, and if you have a gluten um, issue, I'm using some rice cereal. You can just make sure to find, because I know some um, rice cereals, although they may say gluten-free, I know the malt in them, might people might have issues. So just look for a, a gluten-free rice cereal and making sure that everything else is. But this is a really gluten-free or gluten-safe recipe, I would say, to use. Um, and then also, if you have a peanut allergy or a nut allergy, the peanuts in this, the peanut butter in this, you could use um, a sunflower um, spread, which you just get at the grocery store now, and it's actually delicious. So that there's all these ways to make this really user-friendly and customize it to all of your needs. So my grandma made this recipe. My mom learned it from her. I don't know if my great-grandma made it, but I know my grandma made it. And then this was something, like I said in the beginning, that my mom and I would make every holiday season. And I will tell you, this will become your favorite. If you like like a Reese's peanut butter cup, this is like Reese's peanut butter, but like elevated and heavenly. And it has texture in it. It's really the rice cereal mixed with everything that is, I'm telling you, it checks off all the boxes for me. So let's get started. I keep, I'll, I'll talk forever. So I'll just keep going. <laughs> so I have in here, um, half of a cup of butter. I have two cups of peanut butter, which is basically just a jar of peanut butter that you normally, normally buy at the grocery store. Um, I will say the only thing for this is uh, if you have a peanut butter that is too oily, you might have to adjust the amount of powdered sugar you add. Um, so just keep that in mind because a lot of the natural peanut butters are a little bit more on the oily side. So I, uh, I put the butter in and just kind of um, mix it up a little bit. I have a paddle attachment on here. If you do not have a stand mixer, worry not. You can use a hand mixer. It's not a big deal at all. You just might have to put a little bit of el elbow grease in it once everything's added. Um, and so I mixed up the butter, then I added in the peanut butter, and then I mixed that up just because I want it to be um, well incorporated and I didn't want to bore you guys with the mixer. So I took that step away, mixed that up, and you do not, you're, we're not creaming this. This doesn't need to be light and fluffy or any of those things. You do want it really well combined because when you bite into these, you don't want like a bite of butter. You want it to all be mixed well. Um, okay, so I'm gonna add in my powdered sugar. This is also something that I'm a huge, huge advocate for. I mean, I wanna say baking with your kids, but just really baking with somebody else or like encouraging other people to be creative. So, but for me, I'm a mom. I have two kids, two boys, uh, five and nine. And really, I know my time is so limited on when they're gonna wanna actually be with me because as they get older, you know, they grow up and they wanna be with their friends and all those things. So my mission in life is to spend this time with them now, teach them all these really great techniques encourage them to you know be creative and then my goal is that one day when they are older and like a teenager and hanging out with their friends that they still like me and want to do this with me that's my goal so I'm gonna mix all this up and they can get involved in this because there's it's not really like a technical recipe if you add in an extra I don't know half cup of the rice krispies it's gonna be fine you know you can always add a little bit more peanut butter add a little bit more powdered sugar until you get the right texture so as you can see, I'm mixing this up and it's a little crumbly, but don't worry, it will all start to combine. And then I'm gonna add in my Rice Krispies. This is, uh, so that was half a pound. Nope, one pound, one pound of powdered sugar. And then I always buy the two pound bag, so I should cut it in half. Um, and then three cups of the rice cereal. So I'm gonna get this out of the way. Let's put it here. Do you like my little goldfish? My son got this goldfish at a fair and I've been trying to get this goldfish, this goldfish such a nice life. It's been living forever. So that is, he named him Mr. Crocodile Jr. That is the name of the goldfish. So I'm gonna let, I'm turn this off because I have one already done. But what you would do is keep mixing until it looks like this. So I wanna give you a little bit of idea on texture so you can see it all is sticking together like so and this is I have some that are already rolled so this is what I have and then I'm gonna bring this is a baking sheet and it's lined with some wax paper 
You could use parchment paper. However, wax paper for this in particular is my favorite to use. And I think it's my favorite just because this is something that my mom always did. Um, so then take your scoop. And this is where, again, something great for kids to do and get your neighborhood kids involved, get your cousins involved, nieces, nephews, anybody. And um, so I have my cookie scoop. And this is important if you don't have one of these in your kitchen and you're either going to take on some baking or you love to bake and you don't have these yet. Honestly, it makes a huge difference for this in particular. It's okay if they're different sizes because we're not baking them. But when you are baking cookies, it is important. Um, and I'm sure those of you who are baking, who bake all the time, you're like, duh. <laughs> but just in case. So you can see I have this here. And I'm going to scoop out. And uh, this will make, I believe, about, yeah, 45 to 50, depending on the size. This is like a heaping tablespoon size. And what I would do then um, is I'm going to do one more. And then I'll move this aside so I don't bore you with my scooping. Um, so I would take this and then put this into the fridge. Um, oh, I missed a step. You got to roll them. Roll them with your hands a little bit until they're just like smooth. All that really does is just make it, make it smoother so that the final outcome looks nicer. Okay, then you put it in the fridge. Um, so then put it in the fridge. I You definitely want to do an hour, honestly. It just is going to depend. I think it's going to depend on how oily your peanut butter is, how thick you made them. Sometimes the weather affects it. But um, like I said, these are weatherproof after the, we do our next step. <laughs> but at this step, they could it could affect it. And um, so then put it in the fridge. Now, when I said you could make these ahead of time, this is when I would put them in the freezer. I do not put, um, after I dip them in chocolate in the freezer, I do it like this. Um, because what we're going to do next, you want them to be extremely cold. So I'm going to switch out. I have some in the fridge that I'm going to bring out. But like I said, do a bunch of these. They don't have to be this spread out either. You can see they can be close to each other because like I said, they're not baking. So put them in the fridge and let them harden up. And I'm going to bring some out. And if there are any questions, I am happy to answer them too. Feel free to jump in. So if this here, you can see, this would have been filled by the rest of this dough. And then, here, let's see this. I have my chocolate. Let's talk a little bit about chocolate, everybody. So I have this in a double boiler. This is um, chocolate coating, or um, candy coating chocolate. And you can see, this is what it ends up looking like. It's it's like it looks like gourmet chocolates, like what you get at like professional, like a Godiva or a C's or something like that. And actually, let me do this just so you get the idea. So it creates this nice thin shell. And as you can see here, this is not a coating that is um, has like a like it th gets the beads on it. It doesn't feel soft. It feels like a professional chocolate. So. If you were to take regular chocolate chips that you bake with and melt them down and then dip these, you could do that. However, it will not create a thin shell and it will not completely harden at room temperature. And you would have to pop them in the fridge and things like that. However, this is the candy coating chocolate, also known as candy melt. Sometimes it's called um, chocolate bark, usually when it comes in like the big blocks. I get this at you can get it at the grocery store you can get it at the craft supply store sometimes they come in a variety of colors um and so that's what i get i'm using a dark chocolate today um i'm not sp sponsored by Ghirardelli, but i do like your deli that's what i seem to find at the store that works really well i do also recommend if you want the best and nicest finish for your chocolate. So meaning you don't want your chocolate to turn gray. You don't want it to look like there's a swirl in it or anything like that. Um, then I would recommend melting the chocolate slowly over a double boiler, which is there's a little bit of water in here that you bring to a simmer and then put this on top. Um, they, if you have like a fancy one, that's like a proper double boiler that they like have in France, by all means, you can use that. 
Um, but if not, you can absolutely just do what I did here with a bowl in here. I do recommend this method over melting this in the microwave because you're going to have the best outcome. These are cold. I just took these out of the fridge. And what I'm going to do now, I'll tilt this a little bit so you can see. I pop it in. And because the cold bonbon hits the warm chocolate, I then use a fork. I'm using a spatula to kind of help me out too. And just tap it out. And then, and it can be a little messy, but that's okay. We're in the kitchen. It's okay to make a mess. And then you just keep going. And this is why I love that this is so easy to do. And you kind of feel like, like you're a chocolatier or like you've done something really elevated and fancy. And this is where you can get um, really creative too. So like I said, I do this all year long because you can make them really festive. I have, um, I found this really beautiful, um, like sandy uh, sugar that I just, love. And I'm going to sprinkle this on. However, to make them really festive, you could do a red and green sprinkle or anything like that. Or you'll see this in the book. If you have the book, um, I use another, a, another color. So usually a white, I will melt that down and then drizzle it on. But the trick is if you're doing the sprinkles, you have to do it before the chocolate sets. But if you want to add another chocolate color to it and do the like little drizzle, you have to wait for the bonbons to set, which doesn't take very long. I mean, it's gonna happen probably in the next like 10 minutes. They'll be, I mean, probably less. It'll be set because um, of the, the difference in temperatures. And then you can drizzle on another color of chocolate. And that I always think looks really um, like elevated and fancy too, or just let them be. And then they kind of look like truffles. And the thing about truffles is they're supposed to look you know, a little imperfect as well. So I'm putting these back on, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I put these back on my baking sheet that's lined with wax paper. And um, then you just let these set up. Once they set up, you're done. That is how you make chocolate peanut butter bonbons. And what I like to do, if you go to the craft supply store or the bakery supply store, They'll have little um, cupcake, they almost look like cupcake liners, but they're just smaller. And then I usually will put those in there and then they look like a little like professional made candy that you get at like a fancy store. And then you, I promise you, you put these in your cookie boxes and people will think that you bought them. You're gonna have to tell them that you made them from scratch. So this was in, um, like I said, the uh, in the book, this is in the family favorites section of the book. So in, in the book and everyday celebrations, I have five chapters with multiple themes within each chapter. So, and it, they're all celebrating something that's sort of like an everyday thing. So the first chapter is celebrating weeknight meals, then family, then friends, then sports, and then seasons. Those are like the the headlines, and then each chapter will have multiple themes. And each theme has a set the scene. And that set the scene is, is sort of, it's different for all of them, but the idea is to create a space that is sort of like all encompassing, right? Like, so if you're gonna do, I mean, it's the same idea that like at Christmas we put up a tree or we do this or we do that. So it's like, if you're gonna do a breakfast for, let's say your child who studied really hard for a test, you can add the little elements. It doesn't have to be big like Christmas, but like little elements, like a little note that says something inspiring with like a little DIY keychain that they can take with them that is so valuable to them. They know you're you know, home rooting for them and you made them a lovely breakfast. It's those like little things that are celebratory. And I, that was that story in itself is one of the main reasons um, that I have like the sort of heart behind the book. And so I kind of like the moral of the story with my mom and why I think I love doing this so much is she did that for, for me. And it's like, I'm sure she did it multiple times, but there's one, you know, in particular that I remember where I had studied so hard for a test and, and she basically set up this like success breakfast. It was like setting me up for success. And I'm like, well, we're not celebrating. I didn't, 
I haven't passed the test yet. I haven't gotten a grade or anything. She's like, you've done everything you can. You've studied so hard. And I just, it, the whole point of that moment was to recognize and celebrate the effort and, and really just the fact that I put all that I could into it. And it was, it was to celebrate that and to, that she was, she uh, gave me a little uh, good luck charm and I still have it. I have like, I have a handful of like little good luck charms that my mom has given me over the year. I've given a couple to my kids and I swear there's just something about the intent of knowing that somebody did something special for you. I mean, that's, that's what it is. Knowing that someone cares about you, has your back. And I just think that those, that's really the undercurrent of all these celebrations in here. So the set the scene and then each theme has a DIY. So if you're not a DIYer, don't worry. These are easy. I have a couple that are maybe a little bit more intense or higher level, but that's the point, right? We're all trying to challenge ourselves, but a lot are very, very easy. And then that DIY is all part of the theme. And then I go into my recipes and it all ends with a dessert because I have a crazy sweet tooth and I always have to have a dessert at the end of the day. I don't know about you guys, but like that for me, I have to end my day that way. So, or even start. So for those of us who love coffee, just like maybe a little cookie or like a bonbon in the morning, it sets you up for success in my opinion. So, um, but anyways, I, I'd love to answer any more questions about the book. If you have them, if I, if I didn't answer it already. Someone asked for an easy party dessert. I mean, these, this is a great one. Um, but I, I think anything that can be made ahead. Um, so for a party dessert, I would say, I'm going to try to find a picture for you. Um, if you want to be, I have two that come to mind that, that could be fancy and a make ahead. So I have my chocolate mousse in here with a, um, cookie crumble on top. And so that is in the Friday chapter. I want to find the picture for you guys. So the reason I think this is a really good one for a party is here it is. It looks fancy. So you can get, um, these are in really cool vintage glasses. You can see here. Oh, hopefully you can, you can't see. That's too blown out. Sorry, my lights. Okay. There, sort of. Does that help? Nope. Okay, you guys kind of get the idea. There, so it's my chocolate mousse. And the reason I think it's good is because um, you can make it ahead of time, keep these in the fridge. And then another thing that I always have on hand, and I mean always, unless my husband eats all of it, is, uh, is um, oh my God, words. <laughs> chocolate chip cookie dough in the freezer. And that's what's on the top. So I always like to have cookies in the freezer, the dough, just so that I can make them um, ahead of, or make them when people come over. Um, so what the crumble is on top, it's just the cookies that have, that have been crumbled and then you sprinkle them on uh, before serving. So it's a really impressive one. The other one that comes to mind, um, I have an angel food cake with a zabagnone. So if you want like a half, um, store-bought from scratch thing. That's a really good one. My only hesitation with that is you kind of have to make the zabignone to order. So if you're up for it, great. That's, that one's really, actually, it looks really fancy. I have it um, in my wine section. I can find that for you. Um, but those are the two that I would say I recommend. I wish you could see the picture better, but um, let me see. I'll find the, the picture, but um, feel free to hop in uh, with any other questions while I search for that photo. Um, since you were talking it. about breakfast a little bit ago, can you tell the audience about your breakfast boards? Oh, yeah. So the idea with the breakfast board is that basically, oh, here, sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the breakfast board. Here's the photo for the, <laughs> you guys, we can't see it. Can you see? sort of see oh that's better that's a zebignone so it's kind of similar anything that's individually for a party individually um poured into like a separate cup um so breakfast boards the breakfast boards i so it was sort of like um a take on like a charcuterie so everyone loves boards right now like butter boards charcuterie boards 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 
So, but I, I, they're popular for a reason. They're popular because it's a great way to put food out almost like buffet style, but it feels really elevated. So the idea with the breakfast boards is that you can please all the parties involved and get people involved in making them. So it's sort of like you're not like serving people as much as you're putting food out and letting people make it how they like it. And I think it's a great way to get people to try new things. So when we were photographing the book, there's a girl that I worked with. If there anybody watched Home and Family when I was on the Hallmark Channel, um, there was a, a girl who worked in our prop department and she was my prop stylist for the book. Um, so she would help me set the scene and do all of those things. And she was here, um, we had her come in and be a PA on one of our food days. And she's never worked with food, but she's like, hey, I'm here to learn, like put me to work. And so she was here and I put out the burrata and we had, you know, the eggs that are made with sour cream. And if you have not made with eggs with sour cream, I mean, do it, do it tonight, do it tomorrow morning, make eggs with sour cream. Um, it's in the book. But uh, I put out the burrata and she was like, we had like the bread. I mean, what you saw in here, we ate. So like everything in here was like what we ate on the days that we were shooting them. All of it was edible. None of it was like made with Mod Podge or anything. And, but she was like, you know, eating some of this, eating some of this. And she sent me a text like a week later. She goes, what was that cheese that was on the breakfast board? She's like, I'm dreaming about it. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's burrata. And she's I had no idea. She'd never had burrata before. But I think it's a great way to introduce, either introduce people to trying new things or like if you wanted to selfishly try something or see how things are mixed together, get your kids to try something new, maybe your spouse is a, a picky eater, getting them to just to have these things around. And I just think it's fun. <laughs> Someone wrote in, um, have you, you have kitty projects in your book. Do you have any favorites? Uh, for the kids? Yeah. Yeah, let's see. Let me pull that up. That's a great question. Um, I feel like for me, most projects do involve kids because I feel like I just get my kids involved in everything. Um, oh my gosh, I'm looking back. This is, so we shot this a year ago. I wish I could show you guys pictures a little bit better on here. It's my fault because I put lights up. Um, I would probably say, gosh, it's anything to get the kids in the kitchen. I would say this one, just because picking one is like picking my favorite child so um but this is you guys this is um ice cream in a bag with homemade sprinkles I love this one because I thought of it as something it would that would be a summer treat because it's it gets hot obviously all over the country but um in the summer months I feel like I'm always looking for things to do um but this gets the kids involved in science and measuring and then they literally are taking a bag full of it has ice on the outside and then you put a bag in the bag and it has cream and milk and all the things and sugar and seal it all up, shake it, and you will have ice cream in 10 minutes. It is so fun that it seems simple. Kids get the biggest kick out of this. It is hilarious. And my kids ask for it even in the winter time because it's like, oh, well, I want to do like a little ice cream and I'm gonna add peppermint. Like there's always a reason to have ice cream. And so for me, if I'm gonna play favorites tonight, that's my answer. <laughs> when wrote in, when, you when it comes to weeknight meals, what do you suggest for a fast or easy recipe? I think that the key to making something easy and fast is all in the preparation. Um, because I think a lot of, I think a lot of uh, the pressure falls into, I've been working all day and then I'm home, now what? And, uh, and so for me, I think a lot of it is, and that's why I came up with the weeknight meals chapter is because, you know, I have, I have ideas for each day of the week. You don't have to do these things. You don't always have to have a pasta Wednesday. However, if you know you're gonna have pasta on Wednesday and that becomes your one day a week, that's your standing date that you know you're gonna have dinner with your family, it allows you the time to, to prep for that or to think about that. And so that's why for me, I would say the freezer is your friend and do the, do the, the leg work, so to speak, ahead of time. However, if I were to pick my one favorite 
meal that I don't have to think about that I can just make and I always will have around is my lemony shrimp scampi. I always have shrimp in the freezer. It defrosts so fast. I just put in a bowl of warm water and it'll be defrosted and it's pasta. This is like a under 20 minute, maybe even less meal. So that to me, not only is it good, it's always like the lemony, the garlic, everything is like so refreshing. And even in the wintertime, it's not just like a summer thing. I make this all year long and it's customizable. So if you learn the technique, you can do the same thing only with like, let's say a chicken, or if you're vegetarian, do it with mushrooms. So that to me, I would say my, my lemony shrimp scampi is probably my number one if I'm in a pinch. Asked, what is your favorite, um, what are your top pantry staples and why? Oh, I think I have a whole section on that, don't I? Um, so for the pantry, I would say, I mean, so baking, you know, your kind of basics, the flour, sugar, brown sugar, baking powder, baking soda, all of those things. Um, but I would say, do I have my pantry in here? Oh, I just put in so funny. I'm like the amount. So actually we were talking about this before we went live about how I was a hundred pages over. I think I had a whole pantry thing in here and I think it got cut. <laughs> that was because I was a hundred pages over. Um, I would say for my pantry, I always have um, the baking essentials and I always have canned tomatoes and I always have canned beans. Um, I usually have like enough stuff that I could throw a soup together. Um, I always have pasta on hand. I always have quinoa. Um, let's see what else. Uh, olive oil, wine. <laughs> I think those are all the things that could be like enough to put um, and spice or um, herbs and spices, like dried herbs and my spices. Um, enough to like you know make a marinara. I would say that if I can make a marinara, that's usually what I have in my pantry. Um, someone asked, let's see, this is about boards again. What are your suggestions okay. for a do-it-yourself grazing board? Oh, well, that I have the whole chapter on. That's in my wine chapter. I think the the thing about boards, and there's so many different like techniques and things like that with it. And I think it's just the key is variety. The key is just to have things that, you know, have the different textures and flavors and uh let's see yes i have that i have my grazing boards in here so um three different types of cheese so it all starts and i have at the top it all starts with the board so i think the board can also help set the scene i think um you know you can get i have these like giant wood boards here like i just leave them out this is how often i make boards like get some i have a big one i have a smaller one i have another wood cutting board turning on lights um, <laughs> and so I would just, um, make sure you have a good board to kind of start with. And like I said, if, if you're doing like Christmas or something like that, you could always just make your, uh, your boards festive based on the actual base. And I have three types of cheese. I mean, we all learned this from Ina Garden years ago that you definitely want to have three different types of cheese, a soft, a firm, and a pungent, like a blue cheese would be a pungent one. Um, the other thing that I do. So I haven't here used the right kind of knives. So, and don't have the same knife for all your different cheeses. Um, but the other thing that I do, I cut into each cheese before, and not necessarily, not necessarily eat them all, but I probably do that too, but cut into them before you bring it out to people. No one wants to be the first to cut into something. And I feel like it makes people like apprehensive of diving in when it's already kind of like cut into then people feel welcome to like, oh, okay, well I can have this or there's just a quick piece there. And I, if you're sort of a host and you're maintaining your board, oh, if it doesn't look like it's the pieces you already cut were gone, go in and cut some more because that will get people to, to go in and eat it. Something I've learned. Um, I love having something sweet, um, usually either fresh or dried fruits are always really, really good. Something salty. Um, I always, oh, this is also um, back to allergies, put the nuts on the side. I actually have a nut allergy. I can have peanuts, but I can't have tree nuts. And so if I go anywhere, do anything, I always smile when someone puts like nuts in a bowl separately on the side. I'm like, they know someone with a nut allergy because they actually, you know, aren't careful when it comes to that. Something to be cautious of. Um, and then 
the other tips just not to not to really read it to you but i think to answer your question it, it's really about the the variety of meats the variety of cheeses and uh and then making it look really welcoming you have a whole part of the book about um self-care and spa tips which we haven't talked about do you want to tell the people about that yes so the idea let me pull that up the idea with um self-care and i i was actually cautious about um i about using the word self-care or the term self-care because i think it can be overused and it's it's lost its value in my opinion however the idea with self-care is that it's not it's it's about celebrating really yourself and i think you can celebrate yourself in some different ways and that can be for me my therapy is really spending time with people that i love and believe me i love my children but sometimes i need a break from them and i i that's why that's in my friendship chapter i think having friends and celebrating friendships is important for our our mental health our sanity all of those things and i think that here i have this here so it's self care to share and the idea is we're all busy especially right now and i even before this my my friend so if i have any people who watched home and family um my friend orly who was on the show with me i was on the phone with her for an hour before we started this and you know it's you make the time for each other and that to me is is my therapy it's it's my self care because they they feed my soul in a way that my relationships with everybody else in a certain way does my, my husband does my mom absolutely does my parents but there's something about friendship and because it's such a choice you know you you can't choose your family you obviously have cho chosen your partner and but you live with them you're with them all the time it's like sometimes you want that that feeling for someone to look at you and under just understand what you're going through and it's by choice and so that to me is like why it's self-care but it's self-care to share and i will tell you these are really great gifts for the holiday season and they're diy so that means that you can buy in bulk make a bunch and it will save you so much money i want to give you some examples so i have this water bag watercolor bag that is something that i recommend that you do at a party Something my mom always did when she did parties for my sister and I as kids, like birthday parties, there was always a DIY, always the craft. I think it's so great to have something to do at a party. Um, but I have a sugar scrub and bath melts. If you make those and you just bag them up, this bath melt is like heaven. I've also made bath bombs, which are fun to make too. But I'm telling you that that DIY element, and then you have some for yourself. Like I said, it's all about the intention behind it. And those you will enjoy too. <laughs> Someone asked um, about summer nights, tips for celebrating summer nights. Oh, well, so the summer nights, uh, when we, um, I have that in my, my summer gardens chapter, but I actually have um, a lot of that in the set the scene. So for, for summer nights, the idea is all about dining al fresco and uh and i have that for every probably every season in there like an excuse to get outside and the reason i put a a seasons chapter in there is because i come from the midwest i'm from michigan and i i would say the one thing i miss the most is the change of seasons and i think celebrating a summer night or celebrating a fall night you know we're entering into winter it's getting out and really embracing the season and taking it all in. And so for summer, it's dining al fresco. It's getting that taste of the grill and fire on your food. So it's grilling everything, doing stuff over the bonfire, but it's all about ambiance. And so this actually is for every season, but for the ambiance for summer, I always add either, you know, some string lights, but I, if you don't have the either space or you're doing a picnic or you're doing something that doesn't give you the opportunity for those you can take twinkle lights and put them in a mason jar and carry it with you they're like the little battery powered ones put them all around and you instantly have an ambiance and a set the scene for the summer 
I also right now with uh, like the fall and the winter, you can use those same techniques and the same tips and just like, you know, kind of move it a little bit so that it fits into the winter months. I will tell you, one of my favorite things right now for set the scene for winter, you know, as we enter into winter is candlelit dinners. And I don't mean like turn all the lights off, but I do have kids. So I'm always very cautious. They're at the age now where it's okay. <laughs> Excuse me. That when you do uh, candles with like the actual, like not battery powered, proper candles. If you have need ideas for Thanksgiving and you have like an adult table, you can do this at something special about having that, that flame. It's like in the summer when you get to be by a bonfire, but candle at dinners, try it this, this winter. Let me know. Cause to me, it just like sets the scene so nicely. Someone else wrote in, um, can you give me any Thanksgiving ideas? And you just did, but maybe a food one. <laughs> yes. Well, for Thanksgiving, I would say, I think we get um, kind of stuck in ruts of our traditions, which is getting bad, right? However, I think some traditions don't need to be traditions anymore. <laughs> so let's say there's a recipe that you make. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. I'm getting over the sickness that everyone has. Um, but let's say there's a recipe that you make because you think you should. So whether that's mashed potatoes, whether that's green bean casserole, I always recommend removing something that you don't get excited to make. My mom can make anything and there is something in her that could not make that green bean casserole. It is the easiest thing to make ever. So she's like, you know what? I'm going to just stop making this. I keep trying to make this recipe. Like I said, it's literally the easiest thing. She can make a croquembouche, but she can't do a green bean casserole. And she's like, I think there's something that is resistant in my body that's telling me not to make it because she didn't like to eat it either. So she created a recipe for an Italian green bean. And it's not a casserole, but it's a it's just a dish. It's on my Instagram. You can scroll back to last year <laughs> on there. And it's it's healthy, it's easy, but it has so much flavor. And now that's become our new tradition. So for something fun to do, I would say do that. Um, so, and then I think, you know, the Thanksgiving is a really great time to challenge yourself. Make a dessert that's not a pie. Do like, like I said, a croquembouche or like last year I did um, the little puff pastries and I put them into a little wreath. It was probably one of my biggest epic fails because it was all stuck together. <laughs> I shouldn't have, I just did so many things wrong. But best time to try something new. It was the best time to have other people test a recipe, you know, and eat it and let me know what they thought. And uh, so I think for Thanksgiving, but in terms of tips, start now, start right now, get your cranberries and put them in the freezer. If you make your, you know, cranberry sauce fresh, because cranberries are great in the freezer, get them now, put them in the freezer. You can even make the sauce at a time and put it in the freezer. All of my pie dough is made in, in the freezer. Um, and these can be made if you want something that's like a different dessert, get your roux made and the, the base of the roux made. So um, equal parts of uh, flour and butter, put that in. For, it's like these little things. My favorite tip, and my mom always did this. Favorite tip is to, I have chocolate on my hands. That's when you know it's been a good segment was when there's chocolate everywhere. <laughs> my favorite tip is to set the table the night before, if not before. You, the whole, the thing that I think makes people the most stressed on Thanksgiving is not being ready. And so my mom, she would always have her table set minimum the day before. If there's anything fresh on the table, you can wait till the day of, but like the heavy lifting and get yourself ready, get yourself ready, like midday or in the morning, how, whatever you eat. But like as a host, I do find, and I've gotten myself in this pickle before where it's like 30 minutes and I'm rushing to get myself ready, but like everything else, else looks good and everybody else looks good except me. And that causes stress. So I think, you know, take these elements away that cause stress and that's usually the prep. And so, um, and get yourself, like it's, that's an element of self-care. Take care of yourself, be ready. And then that way, all you have to do is maybe take the apron off and you're good to go. Um, I had a question from someone about how do you come up with creative, creative do-it-yourself ideas? Sometimes it's by necessity. 
Um, you know, it's, it's uh, like, for instance, when I was on the show, we would have a movie that we were talking about and we'd say, oh, well, the movie is based in France and she likes to shop and we did a high heel thing. Like, you know, you, usually it's like, that's where a lot of those wheels would start spinning. It's out of necessity. A lot of my now, um, it's usually involved with like an everyday moment. So whether that's like my kids now on a football team and the whole football team's coming over and I want something for them to do, those types of things. A lot of it can be out of necessity. However, I get this, this is probably my most frequently asked question. And the, the answer is I literally never stop thinking about this stuff. It's, it's like a muscle where, you know, you work on it all the time. It becomes strong. And for me, I can't shut it off. My husband was like, do you think you could do like a week without working? I'm like, no, it's just, I, I live for creativity. I live for recipe development and I live for like deciding that I want to put a piece of artwork in my room and then I'll do all this research on like cement art <laughs> and then I'll make something. It's just, it's for me that it, it's what is my passion. So it just, it makes me feel so happy and so alive. And uh, I think that's why I want to encourage people to, to be creative and to kind of step out of their comfort zone if they feel like they're not. Someone also asked, how do you combine your do-it-yourself crafts with your food cooking ideas? That is my favorite thing to do. That's my all-time favorite. I think that's what I, I specialize in the most because that's what I do for a lot of television. Um, I do tablescapes. I did that a lot on, on Home and Family as well. I want to write a whole book on tablescapes. It's just a big beast to take on because there's a lot of elements. But um, so for instance, I just did a, a Hocus Pocus theme for Access Hollywood. And uh, so, but for me, like, it's all about, like I said, the, the elements, right? So you have your, your, the table itself is the DIY, right? And so it's, it's thinking of like the height that you want, because you always want a height with like this type of a tablescape, you want height. And uh, so we're, and then we're setting, like setting the scene, going back to that. So we have our height and then we work our way down. So starting with setting the scene, what are, my colors, what are my elements that I'm trying to put out there? So if it's Halloween, I have my, my black, do I want it to be black and white and kind of like spooky or do I want it to be like orange and black and really fun? So it's like thinking of what my overall theme is first and then you break it down. So I always have something sweet. I always have something savory and I always have something to drink. Those are like really good boxes to check. And then all of the things that I have as food are are very cohesive with the theme. So for Hocus Pocus, for instance, you know, I had, um, it's, it was such a fun segment to do. I had the dry ice with the cauldrons. I had like a black and gray table that was kind of like, it, it wasn't like, uh, wasn't like that a happy Halloween. There was no orange, it was like black and gray and rustic is the word I'm thinking of, but I know that's not, it's more like, um, like spooky. And I had soup that had, a little spider web on it. I had water that had like the, um, a little thing on it that said um, that it was the burning rain of death. So if you remember that from the first movie, um, the water is what they called burning rain of death. And so it's like every element figuring out how you can spin it even just a little bit to fit within the theme. That is my favorite thing to do. <laughs> That's great. I think we're coming close to the end of the hour. I think we'll have one more question from someone. She, okay. wanted, she wanted tips on um, your tea sandwiches that you made. Oh, tips on them? Um, all right, let me pull up. So I think with tea sandwiches, I think you can honestly make them your own. Uh, right, I am in, let's see, tea sandwiches. What page are we on? Um, so for I think for this one in particular, I went a little bit more... Uh, rustic because I don't I think you although I love a good tea you want it to be hold on I'm looking for where are my sandwiches um what is in do, do, do. stand by everybody I think for the tea sandwiches I think the main idea is to have a variety kind of like similar what I said with the with the board 
Um, you want to have, oh, here we are. Okay. So I kind of can see it. So Ooh. I have a variety of here. And so I have the cucumber and creme fraiche. The, that was my take on the sort of like classic cucumber one. And what I did for that is I, whenever I, if you need to get one kitchen supply, get a mandolin. It's the best. You will use it more than you think. And I use that to cut cucumbers. So it makes them all like a uniform thickness. And that's what I use on the bread. But as you can see, I didn't cut the edges. I actually topped it with the cucumber. And we did this, I did this with my food stylist when we were, when obviously we were here doing the book and there was an effortlessness to it that were like still felt really beautiful. So I think just like, don't be rigid when it comes to the tea sandwiches. I think it's like having those different colors, the watermelon radishes. I have, um, so I have a radish and butter. It's the kind of that classic radish and butter sandwich, but these are almost like a crostini. So they're open faced. And I did the watermelon radishes. You can find them. I mean, at least here I find them anywhere and they are beautiful. So I think really thinking about the colors and then I was, <coughs> excuse me, this cough. I was between doing just a salmon and doing just an avocado. And then I just put them together because I couldn't decide. I was like, I'm not going to do more than three. And so I tried it with the salmon and I was like, oh my gosh, salmon and avocado are such a good mix. So um, I would say over, like your overarching theme, have at least three because it's, you know, it's almost like design choices. You want to work at odd numbers. And I would say, just make sure each one sort of checks off the box um, in terms of flavor. So you want different flavors for each one of them and different colors. So for a tea party, so to speak, this is good for like making that sort of feel, feel really elevated, but they're not hard to make. This is also one that you can really do ahead of time and be super easy. Well, we have come to the end of the hour and I think we've covered so much. So thank you, Maria. And let me pull up your book again and remind people it's at Barrett Bookstore <laughs> for the holidays. It's it's chock-a-block with information, ideas, do you do it yourself. Everything is great. And it will certainly give you lots of inspiration. So thanks for spending the last hour with us. And we can't wait to see what you come up with next. Thank you for having me. You're